West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Well, I've never been really enraged by a Supreme Court decision. I have disagreed with the Supreme Court. I have strongly disagreed with the Supreme Court. I have been disappointed by Supreme Court decisions. But most of the time, I understood the legal reasoning on each side and believed the decision-making process was legitimate most of the time. But not until this week have I ever felt what it is like to have a constitutional right revoked from all of us. And it is, first of all, a feeling. Before we get to the analysis of the decision, we feel the pain of the decision and the agonies that the Supreme Court decision is going to inflict. And I just want to have a word with the men of America here. This is a constitutional right that belongs to all of us, that benefits all of us. We have a constitutional right to these services, to help provide these services for our daughters, for our granddaughters, for our sisters, for our wives, for girlfriends. We have that. We men have that constitutional right. And because we are being robbed of a constitutional right. It is impossible for some of us to mute the rage that that theft deserves. I would like to speak to America's men for one minute. Imagine you do not have authority over your own body for 10 months. Imagine if that decision making would not be taken away even if you would die in childbirth, even if you couldn't decide who you were having children with, even if you couldn't decide when you were having that child. I don't think a man in America could actually imagine not having control of his body, his bodily functions, what happens to him, and what life would be like for 10 months. It is an outrage that we have five justices on the Supreme Court who lied, lied in their confirmation hearings in order to be confirmed. Remember, it is men who create pregnancies. We create pregnancies through love, through lust, through impatience, sometimes impulsively. We create pregnancies through assault. We create pregnancies through rape. And every one of those pregnancies is the responsibility of a man. And the Supreme Court believes now that every one of those pregnancies, every one of them, 
should result in a birth. The Supreme Court wants to be the champion of rape dads. It wants to create a class of rape dads in America. Because the Supreme Court is saying there need be absolutely no exception to banning all abortion in America. No exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest. The Supreme Court wants to create this new class of dads. The rape victims will have to suffer. And the Supreme Court is hoping what? That then when these rapists get out of prison, if they ever go to prison, that they will then reconcile with the children, the girls they have raped. That is, the, that is the future that this Supreme Court is imagining, filling this country with rape dads. They lied. That accusation has never been made by the, a United States Senator in the history of the United States Senate and the history of the United States Supreme Court. Senator Gillibrand was just saying that five members of the United States Supreme Court lied their way onto the Supreme Court. That has never been said before in the United States Senate. And they are not the only ones. The day after Roe versus Wade was decided by the Supreme Court in 1973, Republican President Richard Nixon told White House Counsel Chuck Colson what he really thought about abortion. That is real Republican talk about abortion. A Republican president privately saying, of course you should have abortion in cases of rape, and of course you should have abortion in the case of a pregnancy involving sex between a black person and a white person. That's the kind of abortion President Nixon thought was absolutely necessary. That was his word, necessary. Republicans in Washington have spent decades lying about more things than they can keep track of. Remember that they lie about tax cuts for the rich, increasing revenue to the Treasury. They've always lied about that, no matter how many times it has been proven to be a lie. And now they've gone all the way to lying about who won the presidential election. What could ever stop them from lying about abortion, lying about what they really think about abortion? I, for one, believe that every Republican member of the United States Senate who favors banning all abortions is an abject liar. They are all a version of Richard Nixon. There is not a single Republican member of the United States Senate who would force a daughter or a granddaughter who was raped to have that baby. There is not a single Republican member of the United States Senate who would force a daughter or a granddaughter who was impregnated by her high school boyfriend to have that baby. They all believe in an exception for rape or incest for themselves and their families. There is no Republican senator with a 13-year-old daughter or granddaughter who would force that girl to have a child. But they insist, they insist that any 13-year-old girl in Mississippi or Texas or many other states who cannot afford to travel must have a baby at age 13 because they cannot afford to travel. The Supreme Court only has the power to deny abortion services to women and girls who cannot afford to travel to a safe haven state like California or Illinois or New York or to a foreign country when the Republicans take over Congress and outlaw abortion in the entire country or when the Supreme Court decides that every fetus has the full rights of personhood and therefore abor abortion is murder in all 50 states. Then the travel will be more expensive. Canada will be the closest option, and still no daughter or granddaughter of any Republican United States Senate will ever, now or in the future, ever be denied abortion services because of the law of this land. They will buy their way out of that for their daughters or their granddaughters. John McCain ran into trouble talking about abortion the first time he ran for president in 2000. It derailed his campaign which was going very well at the time. Allison Mitchell of the New York Times reported on January 27, 2000, under the headline, The Question of Abortion Dogs McCain. Quote, struggling to answer a hypothetical question, Senator John McCain said today that if his teenage daughter became pregnant, she would have the final decision on whether to have an abortion. He then backtracked and said it would be a family decision. Mr. McCain said, 
I would discuss this issue with Cindy and Megan, and this would be a private decision that we would share within our family. Obviously, I would encourage her to know that that baby would be brought up in a warm, loving family. The final decision would be made by Megan with our advice and counsel, and I think that's such a private matter. Mr. McCain, who has said repeatedly that he is morally opposed to abortion, was then asked whether he had just articulated the position of the abortion rights movement, which argues that the procedure should not be outlawed, but left up to individual women. Mr. McCain, Mr. McCain became visibly irritated. I don't think it's the choice position to say that my daughter and my wife and I will discuss something that is a family matter that we have to decide, he said. A short time later, Mr. McCain telephoned reporters and said, I misspoke. What I believed I was saying and intended to say is that this is a family decision. The family decision will be made by the family, not by Megan alone. They are all pro-choice. There is no family decision to be made if there is no choice. John McCain was describing exactly what should happen in a loving family when a teenage daughter becomes pregnant. John McCain lost the Republican nomination to George W. Bush because George W. Bush got to have it both ways. He got to claim that he was in favor of banning all abortions with exceptions for rape and incest and life of the mother, but the Republican platform that he ran on called for banning all abortions. Your position is that you believe there's an exemption for rape, incest, and life of the mother, but you want the platform that you're supposed to be leading to have no exemption. Yeah, but the plat- there, look, I will, I will. Thank the you. platform talks about, it doesn't talk about what specifically should be in the constitutional amendment. That's, it doesn't no. have the exemption. Please let me finish, it, and you know that very John, well. Let me finish. Let me finish. The, con- the, the platform speaks about a constitutional amendment. It doesn't refer to what, how that constitutional amendment ought to be defined. George, it does not. John. You read the, the platform. It has no exceptions. John. I think we need to, keep, need to keep the platform the way it is. This is a pro-life party. Then you are contradictory. May I finish, please? May I finish, please? Right. Please. We need to be a pro-life party. We need to say life is precious. And that's what our platform refers to. And that's why we need to leave it the same. And that man made Samuel Alito a Supreme Court justice. He didn't believe all abortions should be banned, but he appointed a Supreme Court justice who believes exactly that and has written a draft opinion that will ban all abortions in many states immediately and possibly lead eventually to a Supreme Court imposed ban on all abortions in all states. Donald Trump appointed three of the Catholic school educated Supreme Court justices who are voting to revoke a constitutional right. Donald Trump was a big fan of that right before he became a Republican politician. In 2004 on Howard Stern's radio show, Donald Trump said, I have a great little daughter, Tiffany, but you know, at the time it was like, excuse me, what happened? And then I said, well, what are we gonna do about this? She, Marla Maples said, are you serious? It's the most beautiful day of our lives. I said, oh, great. Howard Stern then said, what do you mean we? Donald Trump then said, do you want to get married? I I said, do you want to get married? So when Donald Trump's girlfriend told him that she was pregnant, he said, excuse me, what happened? And then he said, what are we going to do about this? His girlfriend knew that he was asking about having an abortion, to which she then said, are you serious? It goes without saying that anyone named Trump or anyone related to Donald Trump will always have abortion rights in a private plane if necessary to exercise those rights. One of the most sanctimonious prosecutors of President Clinton in his impeachment trial in the Senate was Congressman Robert Barr of Georgia. Bob Barr was on his third wife by the time he was standing in judgment of Bill Clinton. Bob Barr's second wife released an affidavit the year after the impeachment trial saying that Bob Barr paid for her to have an abortion in 1983 after they already had two children. She said that Congressman Barr drove her to the abortion clinic and picked her up to bring her home. And there is no reason to think that there aren't more Republican members of the House and Senate who have paid for abortion services for their wives, for women they were having affairs with, for their daughters, for their granddaughters. To force a raped 
13 year old girl to force a raped 12 year old girl to have a baby to force a raped child to give birth to a child to force her to do that is barbaric and every republican senator knows that on page 66 of his draft opinion samuel alito says that abortion is barbaric he approvingly quotes the mississippi law at issue in the case calling abortion quote a barbaric practice the mississippi legislature wants to force raped children in mississippi to have children samuel alito holds to his traditional catholic opinion that abortion is murder but judges don't like to make pronouncements like that themselves if they can find someone else to quote saying what they want to say so samuel alito does that on page 17 of his draft opinion where he quotes sir edward cook saying in 17th century england that abortion is murder but even sir edward cook sounds like a roe versus wade supporter because he does not believe abortion is murder until the fetus can be felt to be moving inside the room the womb and at the same time that sir edward cook was thinking about where the line should be drawn on legal and illegal abortion he was also rewriting england's laws against witchcraft to strengthen those laws in 1604 to provide a death penalty for witches who quote invoke evil spirits samuel alito is asking the supreme court of the united states to take moral guidance from a man who believed in witches and believed in putting them to death just as we did in this country throughout the 17th century an era that samuel alito reveres in our legal history samuel alito and his clerks play amateur historian in their draft opinion and their scholarship is shabby it is biased and in the case of edward cook it is deranged the lies of samuel alito did not stop in his confirmation hearing it is friday the 6th of may of 2022 and you are in west coast cookbook and speakeasy i am your chef de cuisine justice putnam gunner the english bulldog is our snoozing sous chef and our daily special is blue moon spirits fridays because we are all night hogs in the diner of life well uh, I decided to have an extra long clip by Lawrence because I think he spelled it out damn well and there was just no way to splice it up. And it being Friday and you know being just a tad behind, I thought maybe we would just go ahead and let Lawrence have the last word. And yes, uh, at least at the top because uh, I think the last word in this show will be coming a bit later. But anyway... um. It's not just Alito, obviously, who's been lying, okay? I think that maybe in the Wikipedia entry about Republicanism, there should be some point in a parenthetical that says liars. They lie. You could tell that Susan Collins was lying without even opening her mouth. And why was that? Because she's a Republican. Republicans lie. All right. We just have to get used to it. We think that they will play fair at some point. If they would just come to their senses, they never will. Their senses are that lying achieves an end. And therefore it is good because whatever their end is, is good. By any means necessary. If it means taking over the Capitol and trying to overturn an election got to do it if it means taking the rights away from about 333 million americans with uh, the overturning of roe v wade yeah better better erect uh, barriers around the supreme court make the district a police state just to be sure 20,000 maggot white nationals magus descended upon dc on january 6 well 5th and 6 Eh, you know, maybe even before. But regardless, announced their intentions for months, practiced on state houses across the nation, even had shirts made. It's a civil war. 2016, yeah. What happened? 
Eh, you people can go on vacation. Yeah, you, you, you capital cops, eh, you can go on vacation. You district cops, you can go on vacation. National Guard, get over on the other side of the river. Don't talk to us. 20,000 white nationalist maggots descended upon the district. What was the response? Okay, let them in. Take away the rights of about 333 million Americans. I don't think it's Joe who said, I better erect those barriers. No, no, that's not who did it. The Supreme Court thinks that they are going to be under assault when it is they who are assaulting the United States of America. They are vichy collaborators to a fascist takeover of the United States of America. Oh, did I say the F word? Yes, I did. Well, since we did have such a long opening... You know what? We should get right into the curated part of the show. You know my rant. <laughs> I don't need to repeat it here. Have a French 77. Let's relax. <laughs> For some people, it makes them more agitated. Oh, my God. Well, on the rest of the menu here as we begin in the salon we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy in the Bistro Cafe part. The Biden administration announced a wide-ranging enforcement strategy to hold polluters, industrial polluters, by the way, accountable for damage done to poor and minority communities. Joe's such a commie. The condition of some prominent U.S. dams is kept secret in the national database. Of course, their excuses was for national security. Yeah, they probably think we're going to be pissed if we find out the dams might collapse. And Rob Stein, the Democratic strategist who organized liberal donors as a counterweight to the network of conservative groups funded by the Koch brothers, and Richard Mellon Scaife has died at age 78. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Asian stocks followed Wall Street lower as fears spread that U.S. interest rates hikes to fight inflation might stall economic growth. I only put that in there because it's not U.S. policy that's setting this inflationary tone around the world. I would think there is something different than just American policy. Please. And a super yacht that American authorities say is owned by a Russian oligarch previously sanctioned for money laundering has been seized by law enforcement. You have around, you find out. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link across the page near the bottom of our homepage at Netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And please send us money. <laughs> we need it. If you could afford to spend or send what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month to us, it would really help. And I'm not kidding. And thank you to those of you who have been uh, buying us coffee in that way. And it has really helped, so thanks. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. We thank Tom for doing so. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on the on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, then I post it on Twitter and other social media platforms, hopefully before the podcast. I don't know what what's up. I've been been behind taking care of mom. I got to tell you. Anyway, uh, the show notes and links 
are where you can find the actual reportage, which is pretty important, okay? Transparency and all. If you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West. And please do pick up those podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And the Deep State Archive, yeah. The Deep Archive of the Netroots Radio Library of all these many years can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Okay. Yeah, they still have org. Mm-hmm. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays is by Matthew Daly out of the Associated Press. Following through on a campaign promise, the Biden administration announced a wide-ranging enforcement strategy aimed at holding industrial polluters accountable for damage done to poor and minority communities. We'll just put this fertilizer plant right here. And if it blows up, who cares? It's only those people. I'm serious. That's how these board decisions are made. Maybe not as crass. They'll couch it in some other type of legalese, of course. But when you put on the right kind of they live sunglasses, you see it for what it is. The strategy includes creation of an Office of Environmental Justice. No, uh, no relation. Within the Justice Department, once again, no relation, to focus on fence line communities that have been exposed to air and water pollution from chemical plants, refineries, and other industrial sites. The plan also reinstates a dormant program that allowed fines paid by industry as part of a settlement go to river cleanup, health clinics, and other programs that benefit the environment or public health. The program was used by presidents from both parties before being eliminated in the Trump administration. Let's tear down every institution there is. That's what Vlad wants. Although violations of our environmental laws can happen anywhere, communities of color, indigenous communities, and low-income communities often bear the brunt of the harm caused by environmental crime, pollution, and climate change. Attorney General Merrick Garland said at a news conference. David A. Lieb of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Once again, it is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Americans wondering whether a nearby dam could be dangerous can look up the condition and hazard ratings of tens of thousands of dams nationwide using an on- online database run by the federal government, but they won't find the condition of Hoover Dam, which impounds one of the nation's largest reservoirs on the border of Nevada and Arizona, nor is there any condition listed for California's Oroville Dam, the country's tallest, which underwent a one billion makeover after its spillway failed. Details about the conditions of these and other prominent dams are kept secret from the public, listed as not available in the National Inventory of Dams. The lack of publicity, the lack of publicly available data about potentially hazardous dams has raised concern among some experts. These structures impact people, and this is what we're obviously most worried about. So it is important to share this information, said Del Shannon, a Colorado-based engineer who has assessed hundreds of dams and is president of the U.S. Society on Dams. For much of the past couple of decades, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers declined to reveal the conditions of dams in the National Inventory of Dams, which it maintains 
citing security concerns stemming from the September 11, 2001 terror attacks. We still have to take off our shoes, you know. But in a move toward greater transparency, the Corps launched an updated website late last year that includes hazard ratings and condition assessments for more than one quarter of the roughly 92,000 structures. Now, I can understand if you have like tens of thousands of dams about ready to fail and all they need is a little nudge, you wouldn't want a hostile foreign power knowing about that, would you? But on the other hand, since property is king in this country called a representative democracy, I know they keep saying republic, but it's a democracy. You know, people are going to lose some property value if it's underwater. Now, the Associated Press used information obtained by public record requests to states to supplement the data in the National Inventory of Dams, tallying over 2,200 high-hazard dams that are in poor or unsatisfactory condition in 48 states and Puerto Rico. But the conditions remain unknown for more than 4,600 high-hazard dams, that could cause loss of life if they fail. So, of course, you want to keep that secret. Washington Post brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Rob Stein, a Democratic strategist who was the architect of one of the most influential coalitions of liberal donors in American politics, an organization that has helped shape the left's agenda for nearly two decades, died on May 2nd at a hospital in Washington. He was 78. The cause was metastatic prostate cancer, his son Gideon Stein said. Mr. Stein was a low-profile but high-impact force on the political left, a backstage operative who marshaled the country's wealthiest liberal donors into an organization that he founded in 2005 as the Democracy Alliance. Mr. Stein envisioned the coalition as a counterweight to a network of conservative groups funded by donors including Charles and David Koch and Richard Mellon Scaife that had helped secure Republican victories in state legislators, Congress, and the White House with W. Bush's election, well, some people called it an election, and then his re-election in 2004. It is not possible in the 21st century to promote a coherent belief system and maintain political influence without a robust, enduring local, state, and national institutional infrastructure, Mr. Stein told the Washington Post in 2006. Currently, the center-left is comparatively less strategic, coordinated, and well-financed than the conservative right. These comparative disadvantages are debilitating. Mr. Stein outlined what he saw as the extent of that disadvantage in a roughly 40-slide PowerPoint presentation titled The Conservative Message Machine's Money Matrix that he began circulating after the Republican gains in the 2002 midterm elections. All right, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. (laughs) 
from a point at sea to the circles of your mind. A new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, the KG film. The unbearable weight of massive talent, directed by writer-producer turned director Tom Gormican, co-written by writer-producer Kevin Etten, co-starring Tiffany Haddish, Sharon Horgan, Alessandra Mastronardi, and Neil Patrick Harris, and starring Pedro Pascal and Nicolas Cage, is such a gutsy movie. Seriously, who makes this film? Who purchases it? Spoiler, Cage made it with his production company Saturn Films, and Lionsgate bought it. Why is this movie so gutsy? Because it threads such a fine needle. It's a parody of bro movies and action movies and dad needs to win his family back movies. And at the same time, it is all of those movies. It never totally takes itself seriously. And at the same time, never totally makes fun of itself. It laughs at a lot of tropes, but still uses those tropes. So is it finding a new way to spin formula? Or is it doing an elaborate lampshading rather than introducing something original? And Cage, what star makes a movie about being themselves, suffering a career that's winding down and really needing a break? Especially when you're Nicolas Cage and people have talked a lot of trash about you. He's past it, he sucks, he has to take any part that comes along because he's so much in debt. To let all of that come to the screen, is it an act of humility or an act of hubris? Because as much as we laugh at Cage, the movie ends up delivering him a love letter. I mean, if there aren't a bunch of homegrown Nick Cage film festivals after this flick, then I don't know what to say about the world. And as much as Cage embraces being being scenery chewing Nick Cage, still at the end he does something small and delicate that I didn't see coming that made me well up. The unbearable weight of massive talent plays a very canny, careful, meta-cinematic game that could easily go south, but didn't for me. By the way, my Nick Cage Film Festival? Valley Girl, Wild at Heart, Snake Eyes, Leaving Las Vegas as a Backup, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, Con Air, and even though it's all daddy issues, National Treasure, because it is one. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. And welcome to COVID Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. This is your fast track update on the COVID pandemic. We bring you up to speed on the science behind the most urgent questions about the virus and the disease. We demystify the research and help you understand what it really means. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. And we're Scientific American's senior health editors. Today, we're going to talk about reducing infections by improving indoor air quality. And how a lot of people approve of masks on planes and other precautions, despite what you see on the news. You and I talk a lot about how COVID spreads through the air and the importance of masks. But when it comes to stopping airborne infections, there's a longer-term solution that doesn't require a filter across your face, isn't there? Absolutely. It's time we started improving the quality of the air inside our buildings. We spend 90% of our time indoors, but we devote very little effort to making that air healthy for human beings. As Lindsay Marr, an aerosol expert at Virginia Tech, put it, we don't rely on people to filter their water individually. We provide clean, safe drinking water. Good point. Why don't we care as much about indoor air? It's not like we just realize that breathing is important for health. It's more of a recent building design issue. In the last 40 years or so, we started sealing things up more in the name of energy efficiency. But though tighter seals reduce AC or heating bills, they also make it easier for the virus that causes COVID and other germs to accumulate in the air, making us sick. So in solving one problem, we created another. Shouldn't there be standards for indoor air quality? Well, there are, kind of. A professional engineering society called ASHRAE sets standards for all our buildings, including offices, schools, and restaurants. But these rules are mostly meant to protect equipment, not people. Okay, I'm less important than a refrigerator. It really sounds like it's time for an update. Yes, it is. In fact, the Biden administration recently launched a push to improve the quality of air inside buildings. It has three pillars, ventilation, filtration, and air disinfection. Ventilation is basically how much fresh air you can bring in. The more fresh air, the more it dilutes any virus hanging around. Good. And then pillar two is filtration. That's using high-quality air filters to remove virus particles. The filters have names like HEPA and MERV, and the E in both stands for efficiency. Right. 
And finally, there's air disinfection. For example, using UV light to kill or inactivate a virus in the air. The Biden administration put out a practical guide for building managers and anyone who owns a home or business and wants to upgrade the air quality. We'll put a link in the transcript. This all sounds good on paper, Tanya, but it also sounds expensive. If I owned a small business or ran a school, I'd worry that I couldn't afford to do all these things. Would I have to foot the bill myself? That's a great question. The American Rescue Plan actually contains $122 billion for schools and $350 billion for state, local, and tribal governments to support some of these improvements. But Congress doesn't want to keep funding the pandemic response indefinitely. So it seems unlikely there will be a lot more federal money allocated for this. Fortunately, some businesses that have the resources are taking it upon themselves to upgrade the air quality. Okay, that gets us part of the way there. There's an argument, too, that this is not just good health. It's good business as well, right? Yeah, the benefits of fresh air go beyond COVID and even other respiratory diseases. Joseph Allen, director of the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard School of Public Health, says it's just good business sense. Studies have shown that poorly ventilated places actually affect cognition and mental performance. We all know how awful it feels to sit in a stuffy conference room. Exactly. And we all deserve to breathe clean, healthy air. Last week, a judge in Florida struck down the mask mandate for airplanes and public transportation. News and social media were filled with photos of people gleefully discarding their masks. I also saw news videos of people cheering on planes. But like many news stories during the pandemic, those videos give the wrong impression. They actually represent the minority of Americans, not the majority. Yeah, it turns out that most people want masks on planes, trains, and public transit. That's according to a poll by the National Opinion Research Center and the AP. 59% of people, in fact. The poll sampled about 1,000 Americans of various ideologies and backgrounds. They got the question right before the judge ruled against the mandate and before the Biden administration said that it would appeal the ruling. More than half, huh? The loudest people get the most attention, I guess. But the majority of people in this country actually do support taking some public health precautions. You hear about the people who don't trust vaccines, but if you look at the numbers, 66% of Americans have gotten fully vaccinated. That's 219 million. And the number of doses given out per day doubled this month compared to March to almost 500,000. Big name athletes get headlines for refusing shots, but in the NBA, more than 90% of players get them. In the airline industry, United said that 99.5% of employees did so. Videos capture the shouting, but the data show the caring, and that's something to keep in mind. Now you're up to speed. Thanks for joining us. Our show is edited by Jeff Del Vizio and Tulika Bose. Come back in two weeks for the next episode of COVID Quickly and check out Siam.com for updated and in-depth COVID news. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay, I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. One in six Americans get sick from eating contaminated food each year. Contamination caused by salmonella is especially common. It's sometimes found in poultry, eggs, ground beef, pork, and even peanut butter. To reduce your risk from this and other foodborne germs, remember to clean, separate, cook, and chill. Clean your hands with soap and water. Separate raw meat, poultry, and seafood from other foods. Wash counters, cutting boards, and utensils before and after using them. Cook all food thoroughly and use a food thermometer to make sure food is cooked. Promptly chill meat, poultry, eggs, and other perishables. Finally, don't prepare food for others if you're sick, and be extra careful when you prepare food for children, pregnant women, the elderly, or people in poor health. To learn more about making food safer to eat, visit www.cdc.gov slash vital signs. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, 
Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. The problem with our so-called free market is that it's not free for you and me. It's largely controlled by monopolies, which are free to inflate prices just because they can, letting gougers gleefully extract unwarranted monopoly profits from us. This milking of consumers by tightly consolidated industries is propelling today's surging price hikes. Brand-name corporations claim they're being forced to mark up price tags just to cover rising costs for raw materials, labor, transportation, etc. But in a competitive marketplace, they'd have to eat much of those increases by taking a bit less in profits. Indeed, monopolies are now raising prices simply to squeeze even greater profits from hard-hit consumers, a game of corporate greed that socks America with more inflation. Consider diapers. A year ago, Procter & Gamble announced that the pandemic was driving up its production costs, forcing it to raise prices for its Pampers brand. At the time, it had just posted a quarterly profit of $3.8 billion, so P&G could easily have absorbed a temporary rise in its costs. But instead of holding the price to ease their customers' economic pain, the conglomerate used a global health crisis to justify upping diaper prices. Six months later, P&G's quarterly profit topped $5 billion. And in that same quarter, P&G spent $3 billion to buy back shares of its own stock, a Wall Street manipulation that artificially bloats the wealth of top executives and other big shareholders. In short, P&G used the excuse of inflation to inflate the price of their diapers, then used the extra money it extracted to inflate the value of its stock to benefit rich shareholders. This is Jim Hightower saying, well, couldn't consumers just switch to Huggies, the brand sold by P&G's main competitor? No, for it's a co-monopolist, having also goosed up its prices. Welcome to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. We're joined today by Dr. Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society. Dr. Casper, what questions did the framers address in organizing the judicial branch? The delegates in Philadelphia barely thought about judicial power at all. If you read Madison's notes, you realize that virtually no time at the convention was spent talking about the judiciary. I think that's because they were mostly concerned with Congress, the branch they knew best, and because they were concerned with election of the president. The Constitution provides for a Supreme Court. It provides for some system of inferior tribunals. The first Congress, after 1789, created the Judiciary Act that created the federal judicial system. The real question were questions like, should the Supreme Court have only appellate authority, that is, cases that had come from inferior courts, or should there be cases in which the Supreme Court had original jurisdiction, that is, hearing a case from scratch? And so the Constitution specifies which kinds of cases the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in. And the other big question was about the terms for judges. And we have a system in which, according to the Constitution, justices of the Supreme Court are appointed for life, essentially. Check out more interviews with Dr. Scott Casper in Unit 2 of the We the People Open Course, a free online course on the U.S. Constitution at learn.civiced.org. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the year that 400 black women who worked as tobacco stemmers walked off the job at I. N. Vaughn and Company in Richmond, Virginia. The tobacco industry in the South was highly segregated. The stemmers had to separate the tobacco leaves from the stem by hand. The job paid little with working conditions that were extremely hot, cramped, and demanded long hours. Most of the stemmers were black women. The women found an ally 
ally in a new Richmond organization, the Southern Negro Youth Congress. The group was made up of young people who were part of the National Negro Congress, a national organization formed in 1935 to fight discrimination. According to historian Eric Gelman, the National Negro Congress held the belief that justice came from economic power. They emphasized union organizing of black workers. In Richmond, the young organizers of the SNYC began to make contacts with the tobacco stemmers. Out of that effort, the tobacco stemmers laborers and industrial union was forged. Two organizers, Christopher Columbus Alston and James Jackson, helped to lead the work with the stemmers. For many reasons, this unionization effort was indeed remarkable. For one, in the Jim Crow South, it was not expected that black women would organize to form a union. Richmond was also not a town known to be friendly to labor organizations. But despite these challenges, the women compiled a list of demands and presented them to management. Within 48 hours, they had settled the strike, gaining improvements in their working conditions. The women inspired others in Richmond, in Virginia, and beyond. Their fight was not just for better workplaces or higher wages, but also for dignity and respect. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of about 61 to 62, a tad cooler than yesterday. Uh, Quite a bit of rain dropped overnight, a quarter inch, actually, and we are expecting another quarter inch throughout the day. And uh, winds will be out of the west-southwest at 10 to 20 miles per hour. That's rather stiff. And then cloudy with showers overnight, lows in the mid-40s. Winds will be out of the west-southwest at 10 to 15, and will be bringing another quarter inch. And then rain early tomorrow with showers throughout the day. Highs look, oh, high will be about 50, they say. Getting cool again. No, don't do this to us. Uh, They had taken away the forecast of snow flurries over the weekend, but we're supposed to be getting steady rain throughout the weekend with about a quarter inch each day or more. And tomorrow we will have winds out of the west, northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And it looks like we have an active weather alert that just pinged in here at the desktop at the mothership. And it is an airport weather warning. And the National Weather Service in Medford has issued an airport weather warning for Rogue Valley Medford International Airport with wind gusts of 35 knots or higher. Gusts up to 45 knots are possible about noon through 9 p.m. tonight, peaking late this afternoon and this evening. And there's even more to the advisory. Uh, Southwest southwest winds at 15 to 25 miles per hour with gusts to 45 miles are expected. Gusty winds could blow around unsecured objects. Tree limbs could be blown down and a few power outages may result. And you know what that means for Netroots Radio. How dare they? Well, as we say, whatever happens with the ISPs, it's an act of God. And driving could be difficult, and that's where it's important for you folk out there because, you know, the traveling season has begun. And uh, especially if you have a high-profile vehicle, do take care. It might even be wise to pull over. All right. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County continue to rise. 
We stand at 432,045, though the confirmed deceased have remained at 531 throughout the week. All right. Need to get my cursor in the right spot. There we go. Grass pollen is rated high outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index is good at 28 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is high at level 6. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.85 inches. Visibility is at 8 miles, and relative humidity is at 90%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Looks like London is 72 and partly cloudy. Paris is 72 and sunny. Rome is 70 degrees and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 68 and sunny. Kabul is 65 and clear. Hong Kong is 75 and fair. Tokyo is 65 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 55 and clear. San Francisco, California is 56 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 58 degrees Fahrenheit with rain. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd. Crowdsources from around the world. Joe McDonald of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast. Cookbook and speakeasy. Asian stocks followed Wall Street lower today as fears spread that U.S. interest rate hikes to fight inflation might stall economic growth. Shanghai, Hong Kong, Seoul, and Sydney declined. Tokyo edged higher as trading resumed after a holiday. Wall Street's benchmark S&P 500 index plunged 3.6% yesterday Thursday for its biggest one-day loss in two years as optimism that drove the previous day's rally evaporated. Investors worry about whether the Fed, which raised its key interest rate by half a percentage point on Wednesday, can cool inflation without tipping the slowing U.S. economy into recession. Traders were temporarily encouraged by Chairman Powell's comment that the Fed was not considering even bigger increases. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Eric Tucker of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A super yacht that American authorities say is owned by a Russian oligarch previously sanctioned for money laundering has been seized by law enforcement in Fiji, the Justice Department announced. A judge in Fiji earlier in the week permitted U.S. authorities to seize the yacht Amadea worth 325 million bucks, but also put his order temporarily on hold while defense lawyers mounted a challenge. The Justice Department said authorities in Fiji, acting at the request of the U.S., have now served a search warrant freezing the yacht, which had 
earlier been prevented from leaving the South Pacific nation. American officials say the 348-foot vessel belongs to Suleiman Karamov, an economist and former Russian politician who was sanctioned by the Treasury Department in 2018 and has faced further censure from Canada, Europe, Britain, and other nations after Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, good. And that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up on Monday for, guess what, River City Ash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And all weekend, too. And we'll meet up here on Monday, right here. In West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver